I'm going to give a very short background on the global adaptation goal, and then I'm going to depress you by looking at all the problems with these adaptation metrics, and then at the end, hopefully provide the optimism for some steps to solutions going forward. Next slide. So the global, global goal was put in place in the Paris Agreement. Its goal is to enhance adaptive capacity, strengthen resilience, and reduce vulnerability to climate change. Parties are requested but not required to monitor and evaluate it. These are adaptation activities and peri periodically take stock of collective progress. UNEP in 2017 wrote that there's no existing frameworks that fulfill the goals of really tracking progress. If we're going to track progress, we need some kind of indicators and methodologies to do that. Next slide. Um, and you can also see that within countries, there's not such a great progress towards setting targets and putting in place methods to measure progress towards their targets. So this UNEP Adaptation Gap Report records only 40 developing countries with quantifiable targets. Next one, please. But in some ways, there's, uh, there's, uh, there's some positive news because adaptation and development are very interconnected. This is an analysis by this German institute where they've looked at all the actions in the uh, determined uh, commitments, the NDCs, and related the, those actions to SDGs. And so, for example, one of the um, key uh, SDGs that we're interested in would be SDG 2, and there's nearly 900 activities, adaptation activities in the NDCs that relate to SDGs. So perhaps one can look to SDG indicators for measuring adaptation. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to go into the problems and complexities for adaptation metrics and uh, looking at seven challenges. Next one, please. Yeah. But before I go into the adaptation one, let's just look at the mitigation one, where they've really sorted it out. Uh, there's a clear unit, carbon dioxide's equivalent, which takes into account emissions from different gaseous sources and sequestration. There's an easy way to measure in the hectares of this practice or that practice. Uh, for example, alternate wetting and drying in rice, you can get the hectareage of it. Then there's emission factors, so you can convert practices and hectareages into carbon dioxide equivalents. It's a wonderful scale-free metric can be done for a field, a farm, a landscape, a country, the whole globe. It can aggregate across sectors, so we can compare how we do in agriculture, compare how we do in industry, and we can decide where best to put money in order to get the best uh, outcomes for the amount of money put in. So it's quite a simple s system. Of course, there's plenty of problems behind it, expense, lack of data, lack of emission factors, but at least there's a clear way to do it. Next slide. And then let's compare that with adaptation tracking. There's no clear unit. We can measure the hectareage of different practices, of course, but there's no agreed adaptation value for a particular practice. It's not scale-free, so higher resilience of a particular plot does not mean higher resilience of a landscape. So, for example, a farmer implementing uh, solar irrigation may be great for his the resilience of his farm, but put solar irrigation on the entire uh, landscape and you can destroy the resilience through uh, reduced groundwater. You cannot aggregate it across sectors. We haven't got any measure, so we can't decide where to put funding in order to best achieve adaptation goals. So it's not at all simple. So this leads to the first two challenges. There's lack of a single metric and there's a lack of ability to aggregate information across sectors and from field, farmers' fields up to the global level. Next slide. 
Then there's many confusing interlinked concepts, and I'm not going to go and read all the text on this. This is for you to look at afterwards if you need to. Um, there's vulnerability, there's adaptive capacity, there's resilience. I'm, I'm, I've been working with these terms for a long time, and I have to go back and read them again and again in order to understand the differences amongst them. So, you know, to, uh, uh, reducing vulnerability, increasing adaptive capacity, increasing resilience. What's, what is the difference? The, the differences are rather fine, and on, from, from my perspective are not very useful for people who want to get on and build adaptive capacity in the field. Next slide, please. So the fourth challenge is there's a lack of agreed off-the-shelf methods. There's this very nice publication from FAO that's just come out. And in it, there's 43 different works used by different agencies to measure, in this case it's Climate Smart Agriculture, but Climate Smart Agriculture has got an adaptation pillar. So there's 43 different frameworks to measure adaptation. And that's in the agricultural sector. If you go out the agricultural sector, there's very relevant literature. This is a, the one on this right from ODI is uh, looking at resilience measurement frameworks. And in that, this covers all sectors, not just agriculture, but there's there's 11 relevant frameworks. If you go into the academic literature, there's, I would guess there's at least a thousand papers on indicators related to resilience and adaptation. Next slide, please. Then there's the difficulty to identify indicators and how to combine them and interpret them. So just to take an example, the FAO tracking adaptation in agricultural sectors as 111 possible indicators, which ones to choose. We've done a synthesis of all the indicators used by the major agencies, and in that we'd get nearly 400 possible indicators. Which ones to choose? And then once we've chosen them, how do you combine them? Are they equally weighted in some uh, final measure of adaptation, or are they weighted differently? It's a really complex area. Next slide, please. The sixth challenge relates to the nature of climate adaptation, where the time scales are both long and short. I give you an example here of index-based insurance for maize production, say, in southern Africa, where we think it's a good, perhaps it's a key part of our theory of change. So the indicator is number of farmers insured. Perhaps that's really great in the short term, in the next five years, the next 10 years, but it could be maladaptive in the longer term, where what is required is actually a shift from maize production to other crops because of the changing climate. So tackling these long and short term goals in a single indicator set is pretty challenging. Next slide, please. Then the challenges are very multidimensional. The indicators are, uh, are covering all the different fields. So, for example, Sinner and colleagues, when they write about adaptive capacity, they think you have to address five domains. The assets in the farm or in the landscapes, flexibility to change, social organization to make change happen, the knowledge and learning, so the options are at hand and what to do is is understood, and the ability and agency to change. So this is a range of different kinds of indicators that would be needed to track those sorts of things. Or if we get more down to earth, let's imagine a project in a particular landscape where building adaptation may require a whole host of different things changing varieties, breeds, insurance, diversification, putting in financial service, governance changes, social protection mechanisms, and so on and so forth. This opens the door to many indicators, and how do you weight, weight them? What is the most important in judging overall adaptation? Next slide. Okay, so that was the depressing part. Now the steps to the solutions. 
I should also say a personal story is that about five years ago, I really thought it was important to bring agencies together to try and um, get some consistency across agencies. We had a nice meeting, but I could just see that it was not going to go anywhere. And in fact, I decided to step out of this area of work because of the complexity and the different agendas. And so it was a bit worrying when I was asked to give this presentation because it really meant me coming back to engage in the topic again and hopefully find a solution. So this would be my current uh, steps to solutions. So I think in brief, uh, and then I'll go in and discuss each one, have a good theory of change, use standard M&E frameworks, use very context-specific indicators in projects, and I'll give some sources of indicator inspiration. Align as far as possible with other reporting needs, and in particular with the SDGs, and make sure that there's a diversity of indicators. Next slide. So I think it all starts with a theory of change. What can we do in context, a very specific context, to build adaptive capacity? So contextualizing the adaptation action and identifying its dimensions and contributions, formulating the results framework, having a really good theory of change, and then selecting indicators that will be linked very closely to that theory of change. Next slide. Use the standard M&E framework of activities, outputs, and outcomes. So have process indicators, output indicators, and outcome indicators as as needed in a particular project. There's also, I should just note, there's also readiness indicators. So the readiness of countries or landscapes uh, for adaptation actions. And then have some very concrete uh, indicators related to the theory of change. So for example, under activities, proportion of national and local government offices receiving trainings on climate change adaptation if that fits with the theory of change. So making these selections based on the theory of change. Next slide. So, and then use context specific indicators in projects based as far as possible on commonly used ones. So it would be good at least to draw on indicators that are used elsewhere so that one can, we can build up uh, uh, some experience on indicators and hopefully start uh, reducing the, the from our current 400 down to something that's manageable that many agencies can start using. Um, and there's three sources of ins inspiration for choosing these in indicators. First is this FAO uh, publication that's just come out with their 43 frameworks. So you from there you can see which agencies are using which methods and, and, and potentially use some of the indicators that are already in use. Next slide. So in CCAPS, we've put together a CSA programming and indicator tool, three steps to increasing effectiveness and outcome tracking of CSA interventions. So the step one is it's questions about the intentionality of the desired outcomes. And there's a whole series of possible things that projects would be looking at. And you have to go through the list and say if you're directly influenced, directly aiming to do this, indirectly aiming to do this, or not at all. Next slide. The second step is to choose the indicator type. Are you interested in readiness indicators, uh, process indicators, or uh, outcome indicators? Or you choose that. And then the next step is to choose at which scale you're working. Are you working at a farm or household scale, subnational scale, or a national scale? And once you fill that all in, the Excel spreadsheet spews out possible indicators to be used. And this is just a very small example. And these are the indicators that are drawn from all the major agencies uh, that are, are, have systems in place. So the, it gives you an indicator how close it fits to your, your needs based on those three questions. And it gives you the agency that's currently using it so that you can go to the agency's uh, uh, documentation and see how they're measuring. Next uh, slide, please. And then the third area for potential inspiration is the 
Tracking Adaptation in Agricultural Sectors, TAS, from the FAO. This is really directed at the national efforts for reporting. Um, it's got 111 process and outcome indicators and a six-step method for uh, target definition, indicator selection, and scoring and ranking system. And the indicators are uh, listed by categories and subcategories. So those would be three sources of inspiration. And once again, only using these once one's got a good theory of change and knowing what one needs from the multiple indicators that are out there. Next slide. Uh, we've used the TAS and, and used it in this way as a source of inspiration. So we, uh, just as an example, we, we went through it, we selected 28 indicators which could potentially be used by the private sector in their value chain work. And then we hosted a meeting with the 15 major food companies to uh, make the selection. This was work done in association with the World Business Council. So just using these sources as inspirations for particular purposes. Next slide. So the fourth step is for the ultimate outcome or impact indicator, surely we can align as far as possible with SDG indicators. But just before I go into potential indicators, what do we actually want from a resilience outcome or impact indicator? In the food security arena, I would say we're looking at social welfare. So if you look at the black line, that's business as usual. Uh, social welfare goes up and down. Then there's a shock, and then there's a huge decline in social welfare, which may rise rapidly because of humanitarian assistance or something like that after the shock. But then there's a decline thereafter again. And then a, we would be aiming to put in a project which builds resilience. The project is because of this linkage of adaptation actions and general SDG actions, there's many co-benefits. So the project is likely to do better than a, a business as usual. When the shock happens, the, uh, the project decline that may not be as much as business as usual. And then hopefully if we've done the right things, there's rapid recovery after the shock. So we're looking for a, an indicator and really to understand resilience and adaptation, we need to have a time series of data for the impact. In many ways, this is, if for mitigation, there's a single um, uh, metric, carbon dioxide equivalent. I don't think we'll ever get to a single metric for adaptation, but one of the metrics is surely going to have uh, a dollar value as a currency, although I realize there's many problems with dollar values. Next slide, please. So then going into the SDGs, I'm believing that looking through the SDGs and given their adaptation linkages, the social welfare indicators can be drawn from a number of different areas, depending on the focus of the particular project work. Poverty reduction, food security, gender gaps, et cetera, et cetera. How, would, how does the gender gap change in relation to a shock event? Does, uh, if we're doing well in terms of adaptation, do we get less of a problem happening and do we get rapid recovery? Next slide. So potential SDG indicators linked to social welfare are these ones. Proportion of the population below the international poverty line. If we're going to have to measure it for SDGs, why don't we also do it for projects? Prevalence, prevalence of undernutrition would be another example. And of course, these should be differentiated by gender, sex, ethnic group, etc. cetera. Um, the, next slide, yeah, thank, ne thanks. Uh, so the first step for the process or the output indicators, these should at least reflect a diversity of indicators. So if we were believing in, in what Sinner et al. write about adaptive capacity, at least drawing indicators from these different areas, assets, flexibility, social organization, or 
another framework is by the, these hills and his colleagues, at least drawing indicators from capacity to adapt, the nature of the livelihood and farm functioning systems, the ecosystem services. But once again, selecting them based on the theory of change. At this level, I don't believe it's so important to get consistency across projects because of the real difficulty in that these kinds of things are going to be so context specific. For the ultimate impact of adaptation, we, we do need to get consistency across projects. That's why I push towards looking at time series type data and uh, SDG using SDG indicators. Next slide. So some of the SDGs that are linked to processes enabling adaptive capacity, these are just examples. Proportion of pop population covered by social protection systems. Uh, something to do with land tenure. If the theory of change has got something to do with uh, digital advisories and getting cell phones in the hands of people, then this 5B1 may be a, a potential indicator. Or if water is a cru crucial focus of the project, then to use something like uh, 6.41, water use efficiency, and so on. So once again, trying to align indicator selections for adaptation to the SDG indicators, even at the process level. Right, next slide. So to conclude, there's plenty of frustrating complexities in this area. And the fact that there's a thousand publications on this topic makes, it makes me extremely depressed. There's just so little progress in towards getting consistency. There's a huge lack of coordination amongst agencies. I, I from an outside perspective, I cannot see why, a, why an agricultural development agency in country X would use a different set of criteria and frameworks from an agency in a different uh, country. But uh, I think there's some ways forward. So using very strong theory of change approach to make logical impact uh, indicator selection, using standard M&E framework, use context specific indicators in projects where perhaps it's not so important to get much consistency across projects, but even then, at least trying to select the currently used ones so that we can start getting evidence of what works and what doesn't work. Align as far as possible with SDG indicators, as there's going to be a huge effort in going into measuring these. We, sh we should not create a new set of indicators. And then select a diversity of indicators. And just to say that one again, for example, Perhaps a, a, a project that's got a very biophysical approach may want to use only biophysical indicators like hectares of conservation agriculture or something. That that's really doesn't get enough at uh, adaptive capacity. And I'd, I'd also want to leave the audience with a question. Is it not feasible to align indicators or approaches across agencies? Because that would be a major breakthrough in getting more consistency and, and uh, easier to understand what's happening on the ground. Thanks very much. Hello, and thank you. This is Sylvie Watts from FAO speaking. I'm working in the climate resilience uh, work stream here of the um, organization. <laughs> And I want to thank you for, for putting very well this uh, summary of the complexity of the situation. And I would just like to flag that perhaps one also way of moving together on indicators and, and monitoring of adaptation and resilience is we need to have um, a joint conversation agreeing on the key type of interventions that are needed on resilience and adaptation to climate um, risk, climate change, especially for agriculture system, but also for the other sectors. But if we just bring it to the agriculture food system, we would just like to follow up on a conversation with you and the, uh, the other colleagues 
because we are we are proposing a set of intervention that could rally or demystify a little bit more what is it that we are trying to do in addressing both short-term risk disasters extreme events also other medium-term changes so i'd be happy to carry on another conversation or if you can tell us do you have a forum already for addressing this thank you great su suggestion sylvie to to to, to try and have a joint conversation amongst the various agencies. I guess it would be quite a long list of adaptation uh, or resilience building uh, entry points. Even the fact that uh, contexts are so different in different places. But I guess if you did at least have the long list, that could structure a conversation about, well, what kinds of indicators do we need these different sorts of uh, uh, interventions. No, so it's a great, great idea. Okay, we still have enough time for more questions. I am checking the chat box right now to see any incoming questions. Let's see a question from Sarah. I have, yeah, I have a question. Uh, exactly. I'm going to read it. But, um, thank you for the presentation. I have a ra rather practical question. Irrespective of indicators, how do you establish the counterfactual of the non project path? Is this a problem for all indicators? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Because to assess a resilience or adaptive capacity, you essentially need time series data and you uh, you have to have a counterfactual of the project versus the business as usual or the non-project path. So there's a whole bunch of methods to be able to do that, and it's, uh, but it is particularly challenging and it's a problem for all indicators in all sectors in any case. So it's not only a case in uh, agriculture. But it's a, it's a challenging area, but uh, something that's definitely needed of having a counterfactual. Okay, and I, I'm going to continue on to the second question uh, from John Choptiania. Are there specific tools or approaches, ex for example, one of those reports that you highlighted that you would recommend that people converge on or do you think that we need to collectively come up with a new set of indicators together? That's from John. No, so John, I, I think it would be very dangerous for me to suggest one because the agency that I suggest would be very happy and the others would be very angry. So, you know, there's positives and negatives in, all, in many of the different schemes. And I think it needs these agencies to really come together and make an agreement about something. And perhaps failing that and would get perhaps an expert group together and, and really just so that one moves forward on, converges on something. Um, and I think I'm going to build a... Uh uh, on to that with another questions regarding the same uh, concern. It's uh, Manuel Urrutia. Um, provided that culture is generally context specific in the CSA program and indicator tools, how much flexibility do you allow for e practitioners to uh, tailor indicators and their metrics to suit their particular needs? I, th I, th I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good question as well because I find adaptation and agriculture in general is so context specific. For example, you know, conservation agriculture in particular location, a particular set of household assets, a great way to do uh, to build adaptive capacity location where those assets are missing and the biophysical conditions are different, it may be the totally maladaptive pathway. So many examples like that. Therefore, one does have to be very context-specific. 
I'm still, I, I would still think that if one had a long list of indicators, and perhaps what Sylvie suggests is to have a set of indicators for different contexts, one could still converge on some things which are similar. So the, the difference is the. It's also depending on if you're thinking about process indicators or, or output and outcome indicators. At the process level, perhaps it's not so. There's going to be such divergence in context specificity that you could imagine very uh, indicators for specific projects. As you go up the uh, up the back pathway towards outputs and impacts, hopefully there's more convergence. Uh, yeah, hi, this is Todd Crane from ILRI, and I'd like to broaden the conversation a little bit because much of this presentation was focused around project level indicators. But at the same time, national governments are increasingly mandated to do reporting against uh, the NDCs um, internationally. We uh, merge these conversations so that the project style indicators uh, conversation can go into the conversations at national level government uh, reporting. Yeah, so um, you know the mitigation people have really got it down e an easy job because they go from uh, fields to the globe, all with the same indicators more or less. Uh, and one would hope that these connections as well in the in what we think about adaptation. So one can think of some indicators at least which can potentially scale, such as uh, uh, dollar one income at farm level, income at district level, income at global levels. Uh, so there are, are, are potential indicators and in some of the frameworks that I've presented, for example, the TAS from FAO is, a, is, is really focused at the national level, but within it there's indicators that you can use at project level. So I, I, don't, I don't totally see the disconnect between project level approaches and uh, national level approaches. Well, I'm sure we could keep talking about this for a long time, but yeah, I think the the, the interest of level M and E, the, the the purpose of that is very different than kind of national level reporting to against national agreements. So I, I think that those different contexts are are at some level going to require different uh, types of measurements with with inevitable trade offs along the way. But but I but I think these. Um, between those two different levels of tracking and reporting is, is going to be an important thing to thread into the conversation at this early uh, stage. I'm going to read on the next comment. Uh, James is uh, asking, indicators usually are both climatic and non-climatic variables, such as population growth, poverty, and food insecurity. Do you frequently encounter the issue of data overload? If so, how do you handle the situation? It's an impossible question to answer because it's totally true. Yeah. So, you know, the complaint about the SDG indicators, there's hundreds of them. If, if countries are going to implement these, it's going to be extremely costly. Um, yeah. It, I mean, to go as simple as possible is the only solution. As few indicators as is really feasible. Uh, you know, it's a project level, is it possible to get it down to, I don't know, N indicators, that kind of level? It's uh, extremely difficult uh, to, to imagine. And I've, I've even seen in the latest uh, uh, from FAO that they get quite a massive budget increase in terms of the data management requirements for the SDG, so it's a real challenge for countries as well. Right. Um, and I'm going to keep on reading the next question from Laura Barrington. 
um, uh, from the platform secretariat. Um, thank you for your, your presentation, Bruce. Uh, do you have any advice for dealing with a situation where there is a lack of uh, baseline information to formulate indicators? So, Laura, I, d I, don't see, I don't really see that as a problem. Because if one starts with a theory of change, then one you know, that for me is the way of selecting the indicators. And then, of course, to be practical about which indicators are easy to collect and not easy to collect and for which there's no information available. There's absolutely no information on, a, on particular indicators. One would have to start with the baseline, uh, baseline work in particular areas. So I don't see it as the challenge, unless I'm missing something. I can also uh, pose uh, one question, but rather on the theoretical level, Bruce, if you allow me. Go ahead. So it's just something uh, related with the, the theory of change. Uh, so in general, the theory states that uh, states what expected uh, or changed result will follow from a particular set of action. And uh, most of the critics of the theory are commonly direct the linear thinking of the theory, which assumes that inputs leads to outputs and that outputs leads to outcomes. Do you see any pitfall of, of, of applying such a theory in formulating indicators related to a complex and non-linear system as climate change and agriculture? Yes, I, d I definitely see pitfalls, but I, uh, and I, totally believe that um, that everything is not linear and there's learning and change and one has to adjust. But I think that in good project design, one also has the possibility of changing one's theory of change. That, of course, gives challenges for, for impact in indicator selection. If, for example, there's a massive change in direction as a result of what's happening, essentially a new set of indicators may, may become more valid than the past ones. So uh, that, that would be a, a big challenge in terms of, you know, you can't, you can't just be keeping on changing indicators all the time. So I agreed with you that everything shouldn't be linear, but hopefully that one's wise enough to choose robust indicators that will uh, be meaningful in particular contexts. Perhaps I have a question for the people in agencies is what would it take to come together to really converge on a single framework for adaptation monitoring or is it an impossible dream? I'm not sure anybody can answer that now, but I think that's a real... Uh, Bruce, if I can come in, it's Sylvie from FAO. Um, this, is, this is a part of a of a small shared in climate resilience initiative. And this is an idea that we have is to really have a, a shared narrative around resilience and, and um, adapt, adaptation for agriculture and food system, but also valid for other systems you know, beyond the agriculture sectors. And um, and and we are contemplating that this this is very much needed. Our next opportunity could have a joint conversation uh, around COP25, if some of us are there. We're going to have a, a conversation on, on climate resilience as a cross-cutting theme of the Marrakesh Partnership for Global Climate Action, which is across sectors. But if there is an appetite, we could have also part of the Development and Climate Days organized with the IFRC Climate Centers and other partners, and I think maybe Global Commission Adaptation could join. We could have a dedicated session doing that if we have two points of a, of a time. No or we could have it um, in one of the other European location or another opportunity. I think it would be very good to develop that together. But it's not only on indicators, it's also agreeing on these key type of interventions because that can be linked to indicators. Where, and then what you put is very good is the notion of scale, farm, ecosystem, subnational, national levels. There should be coherence also for up to the global debt levels with the, with the SDGs. I believe it's feasible. Over. 
Great, Sylvie. It's a very positive response. Uh, this is from Maria Fala Leva. Um, in the next month, we will be working on a joint methodology for FAO. I would very much appreciate to connect with all interested to work on a joint approach. Apologies, I cannot speak now in the airport. And now there's uh, more questions from Julian Anderson. Um, how to deal with differences between short and long term adaptation goals? What would be a meaningful time frame for adaptation projects considering that long term predictions of climate change effects are prone to uncertainty and the need to demonstrate positive impact in a relatively short time period? Do we need to work with CC scenarios? Yes, we are mostly focused on the short term. There's enough challenges in okay. given climate change variability, and there's plenty of evidence that this variability is linked to uh, global warming. So I think a lot of has to actually be focused on uh, climate change variability and extreme events and changing seasons and those sorts of things. And therefore, that fits project type interventions. However, the, I, th I think that one at least has to give a little attention to the longer term. So in other words, working with climate change scenarios, and there's quite a lot of work in the climate science community on decade level scenarios. So that one at least is implementing no regret options or at least thinking about maladaption and the possibility that short-term actions which deal with variability may not may, may well be maladaptive in the longer term. So the, the answer is uh, perhaps 85% of the effort is, is, is short-term and dealing with uh, climate change impacts that we're already feeling and, and some small amount of effort is making sure that we understand at least try and understand the no regret options for the kinds of uh, predictions that are uh, relevant in particular places. I, I would like to uh, submit a second question. Um, staying in the theme of difficult questions. So who is the, who's speaking? I'm sorry, this is Todd Crane from Ilri. Okay, Todd, I hope you can answer your own question. <laughs> well, I want to know what you think. Um, you know, we're thus far we're treating adaptation as a, as a we can observe it's a it's a technical practice. Um, we haven't clearly addressed, I think, as a as a tracking community and an intervention community, the questions of of how adaptation is inevitably creating winners and losers. Uh, sometimes through hard trade-offs uh, that are deliberately made, sometimes through uh, vested interests and power plays that are made through any processes of change. Uh, so how can we integrate this, the distributional effects of adaptation as a part of tracking? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so I... I... I'm totally in agreement with you that there's going to be winners and losers. Um, and But I think that that would be part of your theory of change, so that one has an understanding of where things are likely to go for marginalized groups, and that one has differentiated interventions that try and address some of those. And let's just take one extreme, let's take an extreme, extreme example of an area where solution is um, improved agricultural productivity for some farmers, but uh, for a good portion of the farmers, the, perhaps their land holdings are too small, they haven't got the assets which can link them to markets, and that actually the best option for those farmers may be to exit agriculture extreme example. Uh -huh. um, and then I would say that the theory of change for adaptation is, is and the project interventions are also talking about exiting agriculture and social protection schemes and those sorts of things. And then some of the adaptation option indicators 
are then linked into that. So there's some indicators which are dealing with certain portions of the population mm -hmm. and some indicators which are dealing with other portions of and that well, of course all the indicators are differentiated by sex and organization, sure. etc. Well, I suppose my my question background to it uh, goes back to is that my given uh, current research project that I'm working on through uh, GIZ funded um, project is trying to look at developing adaptation tracking protocols for livestock systems, variety of livestock systems in East Africa uh, for national govern governments to report against the Paris Agreement. So it's less about a theory of change in a project than, un than trying to anticipate pathways of change in across landscapes, the logical landscapes. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm less thinking about m and &E of a project and a theory of change than a global governance questions uh, on change writ large. But I think it, it, I would still say that a theory of change approach to not to, you to make interventions, but for you to understand the possible trajectories happening would be a, a good starting point to mm -hmm. what to be measuring and those sorts of things. Okay, no, that's that's a helpful response. Just to follow up, I mean, for for example, national governments don't really have a theory of change, but they exactly. do have national plans, and they do have objectives, and one can then uh, think about what's likely to happen and what may no may not may happen as a result of plans which may not which may will create winners and losers. Then have a system to. To, to be able to track what's happening based on one's essentially a theory of change, though the government wouldn't be calling it that. No, of course not. Would you like to get a few more um, insights or just go over again the practical steps uh, to the participants, uh, just uh, to summarize the points that we've discussed as well uh, during the discussion? Yeah, no, I think um, uh, uh, rather than summarizing what I said already, I think the uh, discussion has been interesting and perhaps a uh, really positive part is the interest by some to to try and uh, have a joint conversation about these issues. I think that would be extremely valuable, especially if, of course, convergence could be achieved at the end because there's still very agency-specific agendas, but that would be Great if that happened. And then some of the questions have really highlighted the challenge, uh, challenges which perhaps I didn't talk about, which are things like counterfactuals, the fact that data, uh, data overload and the real expense of doing these baseline surveys and tracking systems. And then the stuff that Todd also brought up about winners and losers and making sure one's understanding the full spectrum of, event, of things that are happening in particular landscapes or national, national jurisdictions. So I think that's all for me. Thanks. Okay. All right. Then if we don't have anything else to ask and to comment on, then uh, we can uh, close the sessions. Uh, but before that, I would like to thank everyone for your time, uh, for engaging uh, in this webinar. And I would like to thank Bruce for uh, his time to prepare this uh, slideshows uh, and to uh, basically present and respond to all the questions. Thank you so much, Bruce. Uh, um, I hope that uh, everyone um, can learn uh, from uh, what has been presented and has been discussed. If you have any questions that you would like to address, uh, feel free to uh, to um, our webinar consultant, Emily uh, uh, Kilham. Uh, the email address is provided in the invitation. Uh, and I would also like to remind everyone that we will 
upload the recording of the webinar um, and also the highlight and the full report of it in our website uh, www.donorplatform.org uh, slash webinars um, yeah we will we'll update all the information there so thank you everyone and uh, have a good um, afternoon have a good uh, evening or a good start of your day